Disclosure, I was invited by the Panzer Museum. In this video, I interview a former Leopard 2 gunner about what measures and tactics are used by tank crews to avoid getting hit by anti-tank guided missiles, in short, ATGMs. We cover both ground and air-based ATGMs. For the helicopter perspective, check out this video by Military Aviation History. Well, first and uh, foremost, I will tell you that uh, this all started to show up in the 70s with the experience that were gained in Israel uh, against uh, its neighbors in the war, for example, with the use of the Zaga. And uh, from that on, uh, basically, the tactics just slightly changed in the last 50 years from the 70s on. And uh, the biggest thing is about like uh, the movement that you have, the way you move, for example, that you use... Uh, the terrain that you have, that you have an open terrain and the vehicles need to uh, enlarge their distance in between each other, for example, going over 100 meters, not below, because with the ATGM you have to know that you can engage a single target, but if this target uh, recognizes that it's under attack, it can make like countermeasures, fire its smoke, so the gunner of the ATGM can just select another target and uh, pull the missile to the next target and engage that. That's uh, that's why it's also important, uh, the communication in this case, that uh, if you see that either you are under engagement of an ATGM or anyone else in your unit, that you say it uh, clear on the radio uh, in a short message without like uh, talking too much and everyone can like react to it as if he is under attack. The most simple solution will be to pop up smoke. You have to see that like a smoke can deploy in like roughly three to four seconds to have like a complete dense cloud in front of you. And uh, ATGM in long distances will need uh, sometimes more than 10 seconds to reach you. So if you recognize the launch, for example, you have plenty enough time to deploy smoke, uh, hit in the reverse gear and uh, driving in a zigzag uh, backwards. So the missile will probably uh, miss you. But you can't uh, see all of it. And uh, often it's a case that the first vehicle will get hit because you can't uh, see always the launch. In that case, it's important to uh, spread your formation as wide as possible, but uh, still in a size that is uh, usable so that you have like a visual on your uh, other vehicles that you can see them and uh, that you drive like in a zigzag, in a not repeating zigzag, like say that way that you are doing like all constant S shapes. So the ATGM driver knows where you will end up with your S because you're always driving the exact same. And also it's uh, to reduce and increase your speed. It's said that you, when you drive on the open field that the tank is uh, supposed to drive as fast as possible to avoid getting hit because a fast driving tank with like 50 km per hour is harder to hit like a slow driving tank. I think we saw a lot of videos about that in recent time, that the slow driving vehicles are easier to hit. And uh, when you drive in a fast and then in a like S pattern and with a bigger turn, a smaller turn, a bigger turn again, it makes it more harder to acquire to you as a target and it, it increases your possibility of surviving in that way. I also read, I think, in one um, in, in one regulation that drive like water flows. What what does that mean? Yes, um, uh, it's mean basically that you are supposed to drive like water flows. If, for example, you have a hill in front of you, you're not driving over the hill; you're driving around it because the water is always uh, driving through ravines and uh, not over a crest. And that's also one of the points that comes in hand in hand with also the the rule of thumb that you are supposed to drive between covers. So you're not uh, to uh, cross like three kilometers of open field because that's like your perfect target for any helicopter plane, ATGM or something else. But uh, that you should uh, look where you will to drive uh, as next as possible. As next. So you see a tree, I will drive to this tree, then from this tree to like this ruined or this barn and uh, from there into this ravine and that you drive from point to point and you see that you have cover there. And it's uh, in the perfect condition, you should uh, choose these points in a distance of around uh, 10 seconds so that you can reach the next cover before a possible ATGM could hit you. That's uh, 
one of these points that you use the terrain for your advantage both in cover and also to make it harder to spot you in the first place but uh, as soon as you know that you are spotted for example in the open terrain in the flat terrain then you have only one uh, option that is speed driving slowly in an open field is like uh, suicide for any armored vehicle uh, and so basically using hatches like or, or the edges of a wood to drive along and not on the open field and something and what if you run into like uh, mines or other obstacles that reduce the mobility of the tank or basically make it impossible to move forward? Well, first uh, we have to see that mines are like uh, have a purpose of slowing you down. The main purpose of mines is not uh, directly to destroy you, but to slow your movement down. And uh, per doctrine, it's uh, to assume that always on mines is also an enemy watching it. Because that's uh, like the goal, you are slowed down and then you get attacked by either ATGMs, uh, artillery or uh, maybe even infantry laying on the, ro on the area around you. And as a tank you can't do anything against mines except of like uh, reversing out of the situation. Because that's a situation that engineers need to clear and uh, you need to first to gain a bigger picture of the whole area if there is enemy still present and so on. And that's uh, something... You can't do with a tank. If you just uh, stop there and do nothing, uh, that's exactly what the enemy wants. And that's why as soon as you hit a mine, the normal reaction will be to reverse out and uh, escape in the same situation like you will hit an ambush. Because you have to always assume that enemy is also present with these mines and just waiting for you to slow down so he can engage you. And, and basically I assume that if you hit a mine, everyone has to drive back exactly in the in the track marks they, they created before, ideally. Yes, uh, yes. And it's also to assume that uh, anti-tank mines are laid in a mixture with anti-infantry mines. For example, if the first vehicle can't be like recovered because the damage is too hard, a uh, normal situation is possible to recover a tank with another tank. That's why all tanks have like these towing cables and it's a situation of like uh, less than a minute to hook on these to towing cables and to recover a vehicle. But in some situations it's not possible and then it's important for the crew if they disembark from the uh, from the tank, for example from the Leopard, that they will leave the vehicle over the engine bay and will walk inside the track pads to avoid hitting an uh, anti-personal mine. Because uh, yes, even if there's not anti-personal mine, treat it as if it will be there. Because it's always a high possibility to mixture these mines, anti-personal and anti-vehicle mines. Yeah, as far as I remember, I think the, the combat engineer told me also that it's usually mixed. Anything else what, what refers to ground-based ATGM defense preparation? Well, one thing is we are learned to, to uh, if possible, to shoot at the launcher. But even with the Zagger and now with the current uh, systems like Stukna from Ukraine, you have the possibility that the launcher and the control unit where the gunner is uh, himself sitting is not at the same place. You have sometimes like distance of 50 meters uh, next to it. Because in the normal thinking you shoot at the launcher and you don't even have to hit it, but uh, for example if you hit closely enough to the launcher, it's the possibility that the gunner is scared or that he will miss the missile because the shock or something will happen with the guidance system and that's uh, one point that you can't count on because it's possible that the gunner is sitting on a completely different position and uh, you don't know where he's sitting and that's uh, one uh, nasty part uh, compared from infantry used systems and then you have uh, the vehicle mounted system for example of on infantry fighting vehicles and also it's very famous on Russian tanks, for example, that's something uh, NATO is uh, very concerned of because these ATGMs launched from tanks have a r relatively long distance that they can engage with. But then it's a situation where you fight against a vehicle, a vehicle you mostly can spot and you can probably engage. And if you see the rotation speed of a vehicle, the time you need to laser and the travel distance of APDF is uh, around it's even possible that you hit the vehicle that's shooting at you even before the ATGM will reach you. But that's uh, always uh, going for like if the vehicle is actually also guiding the, the ATGM because we see also missiles that are capable of automatically tracking its target. 
So which which type of missiles would that be nowadays? No, f for for example, one system is javelin. You lock the target, you fire, it's fire and forget, and you can start running away, uh, and you don't have to acquire the lock or keep the lock on, on the target. Now, now in regards to air-based anti anti tank guided missiles like fired from helicopters or even airplanes, what what are the, the differences here or or other procedures? Well, one one point is. Uh, that the current uh, air-launched uh, missiles, for example, uh, we have the Vikar from the Russians, they outrange any weapon that the tank platoon has. Even w working together with infantry, you don't have any weapon to reach this helicopter who is engaging you from like 10 kilometers distance. You can only react passively to it, not actively. So you have to hope that you spot it fast enough for that you have uh, normally uh, you have like uh, the tank platoon is containing of four tanks for example and every tank is looking in a different direction so for example you have like the leading tank is uh, looking from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock position the second tank is from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock and so on and you're splitting up these all and then you have a separate uh, separation inside the tanks so if your tank is looking from uh, 12 o'clock or from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock that you split the 10 o'clock to two, uh, 12 o'clock for example to the gunner that the gunner is uh, looking with the main gun side this area the commander is looking from 12 to 2 o'clock and that it's uh, always a part of the looking uh, of the looking for targets that you scout the horizon that you not only look in the forest or uh, fields on the ground but that you are doing like a s-shaped uh, with your optics, that you're starting on the top right, go to the left, go one layer down, then again to the right, one layer down to the left, and then you go up again. So you're scanning a 3D area. You have to imagine the, uh, the battle area is uh, like three-dimensional, it's not uh, flat, that you have to always uh, be aware of air contact, and that the helicopters are mostly near to the ground they are not like uh, several kilometers in the air as a dot but they are trying to hide uh, as well behind trees and that's why it's important to always uh, look behind this as well does thermal imaging help against helicopters or is the problem with the thermal imaging that the range is too limited depending uh, on the range and on the size of the target i mean a smaller target is harder to spot than a bigger target but uh, normally because you have like uh, Behind it, a better layer. On on flat terrain, you have to imagine you have a lot of other things that are like in the view, while on the air, it's just the helicopter. Nothing else around it. So if you see a spot in the air, it can't be something else. It can't be a deer. It can't be a civilian car driving around and so on. It can it can only be a helicopter. And uh, or a one drone point is, nowadays. Yeah, or a drone. It's uh, still dangerous. And you have to report this air contact then. Anyway, if it's a drone or a helicopter. And one thing is uh, that is written even since the 70s in the doctrines and uh, guidelines for tanks that is uh, you are always under threat of helicopters. Like always. Even if you don't think uh, about it, it's always the threat that you can engage by a helicopter because helicopters even could pass through uh, combat lines, could amb ambush you depending on the terrain and so on. And that's why you have to keep that in mind and it's uh, like that every tank crew itself needs to uh, take measures against it, even without ordering it. So it, uh, it's like something that you do on your own, that you like uh, make distances bigger, always scan the sky. For example, if the loader is not doing anything, he can look out of the loader hatch with uh, binoculars and uh, also look for moving targets on in the air. And uh, that's a big thing that you have to be aware of helicopters always while you uh, rarely get attacked with ATGMs in your own uh, territories. So and what what about the aircraft like planes are they, are they also considered as such a threat or is this more like uh, like okay we, we assume air superiority or at least for aircraft we will be wanting in contrast to helicopters is there something different here? I mean we have a lot of uh, possibilities there and uh, the main threat I would say is like the SU-25 and uh, we see a lot of videos and it's basically operating like a helicopter on tree tap level so it's like a helicopter just faster in that situation 
And uh, in that case, it's uh, not something you can actually do something about. It's something on a higher level needs to be done, either with air defense or your own air force that needs to take care about it. But for you as a tank uh, company or as a single tank or as a tank platoon, it's important to report such contacts and it uh, to make it more easy because uh, a plane is a bigger threat to anyone, uh, not only your platoon, but uh, in generally, is to report actually the position uh, in the direction to the to north, for example. While you scout normally a target, like you bought the vehicle on two o'clock position, everyone knows that in front of you, two o'clock. But with uh, air contact, it's more important to have like a horizontal, or no, how is it called, a direction that everyone knows. So even if like your neighbor company is uh, driving to the north, you're driving to the east. So this company also knows where this plane is. That's why you are saying, yeah, the plane is coming from the east. Plane is coming from the south. While you scout normally targets uh, in relation to your hull of the vehicle. Yeah, because uh, aviation is a way bigger threat for the overall operation than, let's say, a single tank uh, standing somewhere in a tree line. So I assume a, a, a frog foot would be easier to hear than a helicopter, probably. I think you can't hear anything. Okay. Because ah, uh, inside a tank, yeah, yeah, okay. I yeah, how loud, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, even outside of the tank. I mean, the tank has uh, not only the engine. People think it's only the engine, but also like the track. The track is also making a lot of noise inside the vehicle. Then you have like the radio communication. You have stuff to do and. Uh, the last thing you will hear is like the sound of a plane. And I think if you hear the plane, it's already too late. Anything else to add to hear from your side in terms of, of defense here or measures that you take? Well, one thing that needs to be uh, said that uh, not many uh, people will maybe understand is uh, you can't always save everyone. And a lot of the situation is, is that the first one gets hit. It's like... Uh, the procedure you do after the first one gets it that you 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 can't always uh, spot the missile that's flying towards you you can't always spot like the flash of 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 it firing or you can't spot the helicopter before it starts engaging but you need to recognize what's happening when it's happening and then it's important for the remaining units to react uh, in the right way to minimize the casualties because uh, it's a war, these weapons are designed to destroy tanks and they are good in uh, destroying tanks. But if you're doing nothing and just looking uh, like you don't know what to do, then uh, the helicopter will just pick another vehicle and uh, will just delete your complete uh, platoon or company from the area of operation. And uh, you need to react. Everyone needs to know what he has to do from the driver to the gunner to the commander. And uh, it needs to be trained. That's the point. It needs to be trained. And uh, the point with helicopters, training tanks and helicopters is something that is rare because helicopters are obviously expensive and not always present where tanks are training. But that's something you can actually train in simulators. Like we trained in gunnery simulators to shoot at helicopters with the main gun. I mean, it's not always possible, but sometimes you have the luck to hit it. But uh, just to get a feeling about it, how situations like this could play out and how to react. And that's something you need to train it. You need to be aware of the dangerous situation because helicopters is basically the most dangerous situation you can face with a tank and how to react. Then thank you very much, Tobias. No problem. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster for inviting me in the past. Thank you for watching and see you next time.